Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to my video today, uh, wherever you are, whether it's uh, the morning or the evening or the afternoon or some other time during the day. Uh, I am Dr. Eris Williams-Reed. I'm a senior teaching fellow in Roman history and epigraphy, and I'm going to be handling the unit on the imperial image. And in particular, my presentation today is going to focus on decolonizing the imperial image. The reason why I've picked this subject and this title is due to my research and also the teaching that I'm doing this year at the University of Warwick. So my background is in um, both a mixture of archaeology and ancient history. My previous research has focused on a part of the ancient world known as the Roman Near East. And so I have definitely developed research interests that focus on the eastern areas of the Roman Empire in particular, and the cultures and cultural interactions that we see in that part of the world. And my research also focuses on particularly how the political culture that we get in Rome in the centre is interacting with that Near Eastern culture, and in many respects, manipulating it uh, for its own gains. This links very strongly to the teaching that I'm doing this year. Currently, I am coordinating a module at Warwick called the Transformation of Roman Society under Augustus. Uh, so this is a module that covers lots of different aspects of Augustan political culture. But something that I'm particularly doing with this module this year is really looking at this idea of how society was transformed under Augustus um, for people all over the empire, really. Um, so connecting my research very much with my teaching practice this year. And what I'll be doing today then is showing you a few ways that I'm integrating uh, my research on the Near East and in some cases other parts of the empire as well uh, into my current teaching practice in this module that is devoted to the age of Augustus. In terms of what I'm going to cover today then, I've divided this uh, mini lecture into two parts. So in part one, I'm going to talk about this theme of world conquest in the Res Gestae Divi Augusti, something which uh, many people will already be very familiar of. But what I'm going to do in particular is do a deep dive into what is going on behind a particular section of the Res Gestae. And in relation to this, talk about um, what other sources tell us about what happened, um, namely Alias Gallus's campaign to Arabia. And then I also want to juxtapose that with the reality of Nabatea um, at the time. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about the sort of significance of this later on in the lecture. In part two, I am going to focus on the Arapakis, uh, particularly with reference to the themes of peace and war, uh, which again is something that people will be very familiar with. And what I really want to do in this section, though, is provide you with a short summary of an article that I've recently read and has certainly made me think a lot more differently about the Arapakis. Uh, this is an article by Jennifer Trimble written in 2017, in which she argues um, that aspects of Egypt have been appropriated for the Arapakis. So that's what I'll be covering in today's session. Before we begin looking at the ancient evidence, though, I wanted to say a few words on this uh, phrase that we are starting to hear a lot more in educational discussions, uh, thankfully, which is decolonizing the curriculum. And I'm very happy for us to talk about this in a lot more detail during the live session, because I think it's important that there is discussion about what this actually looks like. And this is something that is developing in terms of teaching and pedagogy. And certainly what I'm going to do today will only sort of scratch the surface of this. But I thought it would be useful to kind of identify a little bit about certainly where I'm coming from at the moment. Um, we can maybe talk a bit more about where this can go in more detail uh, during the live session. But I guess um, what I wanted to sort of stress from the outset is that, you know, this is a conversation that has gathered speed quite a lot in recent uh, months, but is, of course, something that has been around for a long time um, in terms of a discussion. 
Um, in particular, uh, in 2015, Maria Hussein wrote um, a piece um, as part of the sort of student union discussion of this, the National Student Union in England, about why is my curriculum white? And she really stressed that the education we receive at many universities is one that has been largely shaped by colonialism. And in particular, she advocated for how this whole process leans to a blindness to other perspectives, um, which can range from anything to complete dismissal to forms of perhaps even more unconscious bias. Some years later, um, we had Keele University's Decolonising the Curriculum Manifesto, which um, you know, is just one sort of very helpful way of kind of structuring how we might uh, do this work, although there's plenty of other material out there that talks about this. But I certainly find um, this very useful because in particular, it talks about decolonising the curriculum as a two pronged process, really. So the manifesto says that decolonisation involves identifying colonial systems, structures and relationships and working to challenge those systems. It is not integration or simply the token inclusion of the intellectual achievements of non-white cultures. And that's something that's very important here. So it isn't simply about um, providing um, some other range of perspectives. It's also about actually discussing why we would even consider these to be an other range of perspectives. And Keel goes on to say that this is a culture shift to think more widely about why common knowledge is what it is. And so I've kind of identified here sort of two points that um, certainly inform what I'm trying to do at my with my teaching at the moment, which is elevating and embedding a range of perspectives, but then also critically addressing the colonial dimensions that are operating in ancient sources and also interpretations of them by modern scholars. And this is very relevant for the age of Augustus when certainly in terms of the work I'm doing in my own teaching at the moment, we have um, the creation of this new range of political culture. And I would certainly argue, as many others have done, that this is something that is very much dependent upon um, manipulating the views of other cultures in different parts of the empire. And there's lots of different directions that we can go with this. But what I'm going to do today is focus on just two examples and hopefully give you some ideas and some materials for how you might then embed this in your own teaching practice. So I want to start then with the theme of world conquest in the Res Gestae Divi Augusti. And this is something that is acknowledged, um, of course, in the OCR textbook for the imperial image. Um, and I think this, uh, this sort of extract that I've shown is a useful starting point to sort of contextualize this. So uh, Hancock, Jones et al. say Augustus's accounts of civil war are brief and never acknowledge that the wars were in fact civil. His accounts of foreign campaigns, on the other hand, are extensive and stress the benefits that these campaigns brought to the Roman people. So this is a, a really important point acknowledged at the outset in the OCR textbook that the reason why we have this discussion of these foreign campaigns um, is very much to do with the um, intended Roman audience of the Res Gestae. And they go on to, um, to discuss this in more detail with reference in particular to the diplomatic mission to Parthia, which leads to the return of the Roman standards in 20 BC. And in particular, the way that this is presented in the Res Gestae versus the way it's presented um, perhaps in some other parts of the ancient evidence, but also in particular with reference to what actually happened. And the point here is that it seems as though Augustus wanted this episode to be remembered as a humiliating defeat for the Parthians. And we see this theme of creating um, a military campaign in a certain way, pitching what happened in a certain way um, elsewhere in the text as well. So here we have uh, section 26.5, uh, which is a relatively small section of the text. Um, but as I'll sort of discuss, there's a lot of details that can actually be picked out from this. 
So the text reads that under my Augustus's command and Asbus's, two armies were led at almost the same time into Ethiopia and the Arabia, which is called fortunate and substantial enemy forces of both peoples were slaughtered in battle and many towns were captured. The army advanced into Arabia as far as the territory of the Sabai to the town of Mariba. So what this uh, text is claiming then is that Augustus sent his troops into an area of Arabia. There's actually multiple areas of Arabia in, at, at this time, um, but the area of Arabia known as Fortunate, and that they advanced into the territory of the Sabai, which is uh, roughly corresponds to modern day Yemen. What we do know from other accounts though, is that this military campaign was not the sort of success story that Augustus is implying here. And so it's worth actually looking at this additional body of evidence in order to then appreciate that this is yet another part of the Res Gestae where Augustus is describing his military campaigns as successful, but also in a certain light as a way of effectively saying this is what we should be doing. This is how I want to be remembered as expanding the Roman Empire and a Roman who is reading this wants to know that um, the empire has successfully expanded and in this case in particular slaughtered um, people in battle and captured many towns. We get a completely different version of events in um, a work by somebody called Strabo in his Geography of the Roman World and Beyond, which is written primarily during the age of Augustus and certainly has lots of very pro-imperial themes within it. Strabo gives us a very different account and the extent to which we might trust Strabo more than the Res Gestae is supported by the fact that he uh, was a personal friend of an individual called Alias Gallus, who, who launched the campaign um, in 26 to 25 BC. Gallus um, apparently was sent by Augustus to explore the tribes and the places, not only in Arabia, but also in e Ethiopia. And according to Strabo, the reason why he was sent to do this was for the purpose of winning the Arabians over to himself or to subjugating them. And another consideration was that the Arabians were very wealthy and they sold aromatics and the most valuable stones for gold and silver. So what this source is telling us is already that actually this wasn't necessarily planned as a campaign in which these people were going to be subjugated. So very different from the impression that Augustus gives us in many sections of his Res Gestae. Um, instead, it's, um, it's an ex expedition, it's a campaign, but in particular, the reason why they're interested in going there is because the Arabians are apparently very wealthy. The campaign, however, ends in disaster. So Gallus um, advances into um, this part of Arabia and he apparently assaulted and besieged the city of Mariba or Marciaba for six days but for want of water, desisted. And Strabo blames this disaster on bad guidance. In particular, he blames it on an individual known to us as Sileus. And Sileus was an advisor of the Nabataean king Abodus III, who had um, offered assistance to these individuals, to the Roman army. And here Strabo writes that these difficulties came to pass because Abodus, the Nabataean king, did not care much about public affairs and particularly military affairs. And he includes the side, this is a trait common to all Arabian kings. And because he put everything in the power of Sileus and because Sileus treacherously outgeneraled Gallus in every way. So what we see in Strabo's account then, through these various passages that I have just um, highlighted, is a, a form of rhetoric that we might refer to as othering. So Strabo has highlighted that the terrain in this region is very inhospitable. 
Uh, this is a characteristic of a lot of this kind of uh, literature where people describe the edges of the, the Roman world in this case in terms of its inhospitable geography in order to really emphasise that this is a place that is very different and unusual compared to the reference points that they have of Rome. And also in this last passage, um, this discussion of the Nabataean king, um, who apparently did not care much about public affairs and military affairs, and that this is a trait common to all the Arabian kings. What Strabo is doing here is he's not only um, speaking about the Nabataean king in rather derogatory terms, but is also um, in his sort of side comment, this is a trait common to all the Arabian, all the Arabian kings. He's also flattening the cultures of the Arabian Peninsula into one overall group of people. And in fact, Arabia was, um, if from a geographical point of view, was an incredibly varied region uh, covering much, um, much of modern day Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and was home to many different communities. And so the place that um, the part of that region that Alias Gallus has led his campaign to lies primarily in modern day Yemen, but he's also had support from the Nabataean king, whose kingdom was focused particularly um, in modern day Jordan. And so what I want to do with the second section of this, um, of this discussion about um, the campaign to Arabia is to actually compare this image that we get in Strabo to the reality of Nabataea, um, both as a way of kind of showing um, to put it bluntly, that Strabo is wrong in a lot of his interpretations, um, but also to just really kind of provide even more context to show, um, to sort of shine light on what is actually going on behind this line of the Res Gestae. So Strabo gives us um, more information about who he thinks the Nabataeans are um, following his description of this campaign to Arabia. Um, he says that the king often renders an account of his kingship in the popular assembly. It's already a little bit different from um, the image he painted of him just a moment ago. And apparently the Nabataeans collectively as a people, according to Strabo, go out without tunics, with girdles about their loins and with slippers on their feet. Even the kings, though in their case, the colour is purple. And they have the same regard for the dead as for dung. Apparently dead bodies are more fit to be cast out than dung and therefore they bury even their kings beside dung heaps. And they also worship the sun, building an altar on top of the house and pouring libations on it daily and burning frankincense. So this is how Strabo has decided to describe the Nabataeans, but as we'll see, um, the reality was actually somewhat different. So in particular, um, staying with the Nabataean kings, the kings of Nabataea drew on a range of political spheres to create their own Nabataean visual culture. And we can actually see um, their visualization on their own terms when we look at the coinage. So um, I've included two examples here. The top one um, is of Abodus III himself. Um, so this is the king who is apparently um, connected to this campaign in Arabia. And there's a few interesting details to point out here. Firstly, that he has um, this sort of band around his head in both images. And this is a diadem. This is something that would have been very common in Hellenistic um, monarchical culture at the time. And secondly, um, the obverse image includes Abodas III and his queen. We're not sure um, what her name is. But this inclusion of a double portrait here is something that is very common in the Ptolemaic world. So this image that Strobo has given us that the Nabataeans are somehow this kind of isolated community um, who are not interested in governance, that whole idea is already you know, being chipped away here. And the second example I've given you is from a little bit later. Um, this is a coin that depicts uh, the king who comes after Abodas, Aretas IV, and he's wearing a diadem and a laurel wreath um, in his image. 
Aretas is significant because um, he actually comes to power in 9 BC, so still during the age of Augustus. Later sources seem to indicate that he has to go and ask Augustus for permission to become king, although that is a little bit debated. And the reason why um, I've included him here is because the inclusion on the laurel wreath of the laurel wreath as part of his image is actually um, very significant for understanding how Aretas um, wanted to be perceived on his coinage and also about his position in the Roman world and really the sort of Mediterranean political culture at this time. So the laurel wreath is something that is often um, very much associated with the Roman Empire and people have previously interpreted the inclusion of the laurel wreath as a way of Aretas somehow showing his subservience to Rome. And of course, that interpretation is something that uh, fits in very neatly with ideas that we see in Strabo and also the Res Gestae, that somehow the Nabataeans would be subservient to Rome. But more recent research, um, such as that which I've included here by Andreas Kropp, um, has suggested that actually um, these symbols, um, the reason why Aretas chooses to wear a laurel wreath is not an act of subservience, but it's actually um, an act of independence. And in particular, that Aretas is using this symbol precisely because of its Roman connotations. And he's using this symbol on his coins as a way of saying, I am aware that this is the discourse of power that Rome tries to use with um, the kingdoms that occupy the edges of its empire. And by using it, I am actually saying that, no, I am independent of that and I am not going to be subservient to you. So a completely different kind of dialogue than what we see in Strabo and the Res Gestae. It's worth also noting um, the other forms of visual culture that we see in the city as well, because Strabo, um, as you might recall, suggested that the Nabataeans uh, treated their dead like dung. And if anybody has ever been to Petra or seen photos of Petra, which was the capital city of the Nabataeans, they will know that um, the funerary monuments in the city completely dominate the landscape. And here's one example um, in particular. This is the um, famous Kazne, um, which is at the end of a part of Petra known as the Seek. And not only um, am I including this to demonstrate that the Nabataeans did not treat their dead like dung, uh, but also that actually the cultural influences and the architecture really point to an incredibly cosmopolitan kingdom and city. So various people have noted that the architecture here shows, is, shows influences from Ptolemaic Egypt, shows influences um, that are very similar to other forms of Hellenistic art in terms of the musculature of some of the figures, for instance. And also that there are um, elements here that are very familiar um, when compared to Pompeian wall paintings as well. And in fact, we even see that elsewhere in the city. Um, so we have a range of elite domestic spaces, such as Building 4 on the Ezzantur Ridge, which includes um, wall painting styles that would not look out of place in Pompeii. And the point of this discussion is not to simply say, well, these individuals were part of the Roman Empire and they were somehow Roman. It's more to draw attention to the fact that in sources like Strabo, and the res gestae, there is um, an implication that the, um, that the communities living in this part of the world are somehow isolated from Rome, that they are you know, not part of this high culture of the Roman Empire. And in fact, what we see overwhelmingly in the primary evidence is that they are very interconnected um, with lots of different political cultures that are alive in the Mediterranean at that time. And it includes um, the Romans, but it also includes um, up to a certain point Ptolemaic Egypt, 
um, the sort of last kind of remnants of the Seleucid dynasty, other kingdoms in the region as well, and even uh, Rome's, you know, sort of big enemy in the east, the Parthians as well. So this is really just to stress um, that the Nabataeans were this very cosmopolitan and powerful kingdom on the doorstep of the Roman Empire. And if we take all of that knowledge and go back to the Resgestae, we can appreciate this text in a new way, because actually what is important to note is that perhaps precisely because of this cosmopolitan and powerful nature, Augustus is then very deliberately trying to say that actually they were successful in that area, precisely because there is actually um, many communities in this part of the world who are very powerful. And this goes against the discourse that Augustus wants to stress in the Res Gestae, that Rome is this dominant power and has really ex and that he personally has really expanded um, the empire for the Roman people in particular. And we can continue to consider these themes of war and peace or peace and war um, by looking at the next case study from this session, uh, which is the Aeropacus. So these themes of war and peace are obviously very important to how we understand um, this monument. And indeed in the OCR textbook, Hancock Jones et al um, state this as follows. The subject of the altar combined with the occasion of its dedication, reinforced a central ideal of Augustus's regime, peace through military strength. And the discussion that follows, and indeed the discussion that tends to dominate studies of the Arapacus, is very much um, how the imagery used conjures a sense of Roman peace. Of course, there are a few um, overt references to war, particularly the panel which focuses on Roma, but otherwise, a lot of the dialogue around the Arapacus has focused on the visual culture of peace in particular. If we look at the Res Gestae and um, what that says about the dedication and how the monument came into being, this text obviously indicates that Augustus had settled affairs successfully in the provinces of Spain and Gaul. And that following this, the Senate decreed that an altar of Augustan peace should be consecrated in thanks for my return. In recent years, some people have um, started to discuss the Arapacus as a war monument, particularly Hannah Cornwall in her work. And this is a theme that I've been really keen to explore with my students um, in the discussion of the Arapacus that to what extent should we see the Arapacus as a war monument? Because this is very relevant to the conditions of its dedication. Normally, when an individual had successfully completed a military campaign, they would be granted a triumph, and it would be normal for a triumphal arch to be erected in particular. And this, the whole point of the Arapacus, is that this is doing something completely different to that. And instead of celebrating war, it is meant to be celebrating peace. But I think it's really worth exploring that idea now in discussions of the Arapacus, um, that actually, where does war come into this monument? And one of the ways that we can do that um, is outlined by a scholar called Jennifer Trimble, um, who has recently written an article which certainly really changed the way that I had seen the Arapacus before. And so what I'm going to do is sort of give a small summary um, of this article, uh, particularly because I'm aware that some uh, people would quite like to hear about current scholarship on some of these um, set pieces of evidence in the Imperial Image textbook. So I'm going to give a sort of summary of this article um, and we can talk about it a bit more in the live session if people want to. But I think it certainly provides a, a sort of interesting new take on the Arapacus that is very relevant um, to this wider topic of decolonising the curriculum. So Trimble's key claim then is that peripteral jubilee chapels from New Kingdom Egypt were appropriated as architectural models for the Arapacus. And we'll go on to look at that in just a moment. 
And she argues in particular that paying attention to Egypt illuminates Augustan appropriations for a new cultural synthesis that express the aspirations of Roman power and Augustus's rule. So that essentially by looking um, at this process of appropriation, we can um, understand new dynamics of the age of Augustus and ideas of Roman power, something that's very important to the study of this module overall. Trimble breaks her argument down into um, three different sections and, in, and starts with other Augustan appropriations from ancient Egypt. One example that is used, uh, which will be very familiar to people, is the pharaonic obelisks that were brought to Rome in around 10 or 9 BC from Heliopolis in Egypt. What Trimble argues is that this um, appropriation is not just about taking an object from its original home and putting it in a new location, but there's also a symbolic level of appropriation. These monuments were sacred monuments in ancient Egypt, and in particular, they had very deep connections to um, the cult of the sun and to time as well. So they were seen as being um, sort of symbols in ancient Rome of Egypt's deep past. And the significance then of Augustus taking these obelisks is not simply um, a physical one in terms of the Roman state can take something from another culture and implant it into its own heartland, but it's also a symbolic appropriation of representing Roman rule over space and time. It's about appropriating um, symbols from a very deep pharaonic past in Egypt. And so as Tremble summarises, this is a double form of appropriation, not only taking specific ideas and objects from ancient Egypt, but also demonstrating a sophisticated cultural layering in the service of Rome and its ruler. The second section of Trimble's paper focuses then on describing these Jubilee chapels from New Kingdom Egypt. And so New Kingdom Egypt is um, a phase in Egypt's history that is uh, much earlier than the Ptolemaic period, um, which Augustus has obviously interacted with through um, Antony and Cleopatra, Actium, and finally the siege and destruction of Actium in 30 BC and the creation of Egypt as a new province for the Roman Empire. Trimble then synthesizes these uh, Jubilee chapels um, and the sort of key details um, in terms of their architecture as follows. So these are raised built, these are freestanding buildings raised on low platforms, as, as illustrated by this image here of the White Chapel um, of Sen Senosret the First in Karnak. And the design of them really facilitates a, pro a processional movement, um, again, which we can see in the image, but there is a, um, one can sort of travel around the space within this building. Trimble also notes that these are carefully positioned within the wider religious landscape. So some of them are juxtaposed with uh, sacred lakes um, or other uh, temples in particular. And Trimble also finally notes that these are connected particularly with the celebration of rulers um, and particularly their sort of Jubilee celebrations as well. Hence the name Jubilee Chapels. In terms of then connecting these Jubilee chapels to the Arapakis, Trimble makes two key points here. Firstly, that there are architectural parallels. Um, so as we can see here, as we know the Arapakis, that it is this um, building that is um, on a raised platform, but also that there is um, this, this movement through the space as well, um, that it allows for a processional movement inside. Trumbull also poses, did the Arapakis also celebrate a jubilee for Augustus? So in 43 BC, Augustus had received his first consulship, and then it was actually 30 years later um, that the Arapakis was dedicated in 13 BC. So there's that dynamic there as well to consider. In terms of how we then analyse this monument, Trimble argues that these architectural parallels, much like the obelisks, 
suggest a symbolic appropriation of Egypt's pharaonic past, rather than in tying itself to the more recent problematic Ptolemaic history. What this means then is that this uh, monument, by evoking these architectural parallels from New Kingdom Egypt, is, as we saw with the case of the obelisks, it is appropriating um, much deeper ideas of Egypt in terms of its time and space. So it's not just about a very physical conquering um, of Egypt, but it's actually about um, Rome inserting itself into this sort of deeper Mediterranean history. In terms then of how we analyse the Arapakis, particularly with regard to its possible status as a monument to war rather than a monument to peace, Trimble concludes by saying that the resulting Arapakis was a layered and elusive synthesis of conquered cultures. So we see various influences um, from various different cultural influences within this monument, but in particular, the evocation of Egyptian Jubilee chapels is another symbolic way of showing Roman dominance in the Mediterranean at this time over a whole variety of cultures that had been around for a lot longer than they had. So just by way of summary, um, here's a bibliography of the various um, items that I've discussed today, the vast majority of which you can um, download online and is freely accessible. Um, I look forward to the Q&A with you um, in a few weeks or days, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, and thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to hearing your comments and the discussion. Thank you. Right.